know. That's because I didn't turn it on. I'm really loud, though. Fabulous. So I, I bet I couldn't use it. Yay! Yay! All right. Howdy, everybody. It's nice to see you all. OK, um, so <laughs> here's my talk. All right, so first, for those of you who don't know who I am, I put together a little who am I. All right, um, so I'm Christina Pei. You can also call me Fabulous for short, because I'm fabulous. Kyuk, kyuk. All right, um, a little background on me. This was my first job. Uh, I used to work for these guys who are kind of like, uh, you know, Twilight for Souls, you know? <laughs> like, and then after uh, 24 hours of soul sucking, I was like, well, screw this shit. Um, so I decided to do something that unsucked my soul, so I decided to go and teach some little kids. Um, so quit that job and worked for Peanuts teaching guys like this. Um, this is a picture from one of our hikes uh, towards the end of the year. Angelica's really pissed off because we didn't tell her it was a three-mile hike. That I teach them, remember this sexy stuff from when you were kids? Oh, yeah. All right. And this is where I do my teaching. Um, well, actually, this is like my first home. Here's my second home, which also has a really nice skyline. This is the Windy City. Um, and I'm going there to work at the University of Chicago for this guy. Sometimes, arr. yeah, arr. <laughs> a lot of people confuse this guy with this guy because they look kind of similar, you know, the eye patch, the missing legs. Um, and he also teaches really, really hardcore math. This is one of the best formulas he ever taught me. Follow this. And remember it. All right? Okay. And in Chicago, I also met up with some people at Pumping Station One. This is the first hacker space I was introduced to. And I liked it so much that I went around to check out more hacker spaces. Oh, don't cry. I'll take you to one next time. All right. All right. So, what am I here to talk about? Hacker spaces. All right. So, the first time I went to hacker space, I was like, Dude, I'm not a hacker. This is really like weird. I don't get this at all. And I realized these are all the different kind of cool people that you see there. And uh, I don't really fit into any of these one categories. But in some ways, you find that you sort of fit into all of these categories. And the nice thing is you meet all these cool new people. And they teach you new skills. And uh, you become a more complex and wealthy individual. All right. So anyways. Um, click away. And if you don't have a hacker space in your area, that's a problem. You should start one. Okay? <laughs> and that's why I'm here to tell you how to start one. If I can just click through the slide. Maybe it's out of batteries. Fail. All right. First, you got to get some advice. All right? Some good advice from some good people. From whom? Um, there's that crazy guy sitting over there with uh, my claim mark on his face. He's from PS1, and he's sort of like the Energizer Bunny of hacker spaces, because he keeps going and going and going unless you have to replace the battery. And he's got this 16-point plan that we're working on making really clean and presentable for all of you guys. Um, and it's a pretty like, straightforward you know, process for how to get hacker spaces started. And recently, I also met this guy, James Carlson, from Bucket Works. There's a missing T in there. I can't spell. Okay? It's not Bucky Works. It's Bucket Works up in Milwaukee. And he's been in the nonprofit um, business for a while. And he's really, really cool, helpful guy. Does a really cool, a lot of cool things with the community. And uh, he's been great with just giving all sorts of advice on how to run an organization, how to file for 501c3, and fiscal sponsorship, things like that. All right, um, Nick Farr. I haven't seen him here. He is here, though, right? He's not. Oh, dude, that's a fail. All right, anyways, he's usually the guy walking around in a suit. And he gives all sorts of accounting advice. And he's also helped with a lot of hackerspaces opening. Um, or you can just join his posse. You don't have to wear a suit to join his posse. You just have to be awesome. All right. And also, check out this fabulous presentation. This is going to be the first check mark, because you're all here. All right. So speaking of this fabulous presentation, I'm going to talk about some hackery stuff, because I'm a finance, uh, sorry, some financey hackery stuff, because I'm a finance geek. Um, so, savvy financial hacking. What does that mean? Um, some startup costs for hackerspace and a little bit of basic financing 101 for a space. Funding, 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 saving, saving, savings. And basically, if you want to finance a supercomputer in three of these steps, well, ha, here's how to do it. All right. 
Okay, so step one, click, click, click. All right, financing it piece by piece. Step two, um, measuring the risk. And step three, being open to change. All right, so the first one, financing one piece at a time. All right, a really famous Asian dude said this, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. This is a picture of that famous dude. It's actually probably a fake picture because no one knows what he looks like. This is totally made up from some guy's head and he's screaming at you, start watching, bitches. Okay, <laughs> how do we start building a supercomputer? All right, so modern supercomputers are made of these sexy racks. They're, they've got these chassis inside with uh, individually operable nodes. And a node is basically a motherboard. It's its own self-operating unit so that if one node breaks down, you can run the rest of your job and just pull it out and replace it. It's pretty sweet. Okay. Um, and if you've got a lot of these, you put them together and you've got an awesome supercomputing power all in one just from lots and lots of nodes. Okay, um, oh, so I went to check out some supercomputers at this place, Argonne National Labs. They've got a lot of these bad boys, and they use them um, to run pretty high capacity stuff, and they actually rent out time for their supercomputers. So if you don't want to build your own supercomputer and you still have a really power draining job, you can rent it out from places like this and just use their time. But it turns out that if you use it more than like a month out of the year, it makes more sense to just go and buy your own. They're only like a million dollars. All right, only. All right, um, let's see. So if you want to build your own, you can start out with some basic pieces. So instead of taking their chassis, you can start with uh, something like a PS3, which is in itself a node, and then just take a couple hundred of these, put them together, and you got a supercomputer. This isn't following my clips at all. All right, and one last thing you gotta remember, once you have all these nodes in, you gotta make sure you have enough power. So if you just plug it into the wall, you've got a bit of a problem, because that's not gonna give you enough power to run a lot of this stuff, and it's gonna end up looking like a mess like that. And you also have to remember to air condition it so it doesn't blow up in your face. Um, <laughs> very important things to remember for these. Okay, um, building a space. So this is a picture of Noise Bridge in San Francisco. Um, is Mitch Altman here at least? Okay, awesome. You can talk to him about Noise Bridge, really awesome thing. Um, anyways, so building a space I think is similar to building a supercomputer because it's also made out of individual nodes. So each person is this individual operating creative entity, right? And then you put them together and they talk about all the cool stuff that they've done in their lives and the projects that they're working on, and suddenly you put them together and you've got this super awesome project that's artsy and techy and blinkity blink and, you know, super cool. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, a space power comes from the sheer number of really awesome people that put their efforts into it. Okay, um, remember that when you're starting a space, even though you haven't, um, hold it off the ground, your time is going to be the most valuable thing that you have in the beginning. So don't waste it. Talk to people who've been to hackerspaces, and if they're curious, bring them to hackerspace, because if they're not willing to go and check it out, they're just not going to get it. Okay. Um, make sure to approach people who are friendly and willing to talk, and who have some interesting ideas, and who will bring um, a little something special to your space. All right? Okay. Clickety click. All right. All right. Um, when you've decided on the people you want to bring into your board, um, here are some key members you need to have. First, you got to consider the president. All right. Okay. Um, don't get too cocky. It doesn't have to be you just because you're starting it. Just remember you can find someone who's charismatic, like my buddy Bam over here, right? Who, uh, <laughs> you know, personable, political consistent, a really good role model, someone you want to have around, go-to guy, um, just to keep your shit together, all right? Okay, um, next you need to find a treasurer. Honestly, this guy isn't the best treasurer you can get. I think he's going to be better, all right? Get a finance geek who really likes to work with numbers, all right? It can be someone with accounting or financial background, but it really doesn't have to be. Someone who's just really dedicated and is willing to put in the time 
to make all of these numbers uh, work out for you and also to make it transparent. So think about putting up some kind of shared document between your members so that everyone's seeing where the money's going in and where it's coming out. Okay. Uh, then PR, you always need someone to spread the word. Um, basically find someone who just likes to talk it up a lot, who has a lot of energy and is passionate about the space, who's really good with members of your community, wherever that may be. Um, get them to talk to people, network, get everybody involved and excited about this new thing called the hacker space. All right, the next thing, the secretary, someone who's hot and looks good in a short skirt, all right? All right, no, um, <laughs> doesn't really matter. Sexiness is just one of like the extras you can have in a good secretary. But really, she's got to, you know, he or she needs to be a good organizer, take good notes, um, and also construct guidelines that are easily replicable. This is really important. You don't want to make things that you have to repeat over and over again. So drafting out uh, solid waivers and rules and guidelines for everyone to follow that can be used over and over again through the lifetime of your space, okay? Also, paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. You'd be surprised how much paperwork comes out. It's not just the finances and the bookkeeping that the treasurer keeps, takes care of, but also your articles of incorporation, your bylaws. Eventually, if you want to file for 501c3 status, all the stuff you need to take care of, yada, yada, yada. And the short skirt. Okay, next, web design. Duh, right? You're a hacker space. Come find someone who's really good with web design. Come out with something rocking that people want to look at. All right, what goes in, what comes out? Make sure that each member that you bring on is bringing something positive to the space and has something awesome to offer. So if you take on um, a lot of members, make sure that you have the space to support it. Make sure you have the network to support it. Make sure you have the right rules that are replicable to support it. Um, and that's all. All right, make sure it doesn't explode in your face. All right, measuring the risk, step two. Okay, so this is a picture I drew up of the trend of the stock market. It goes up, it goes down, blah, blah, blah. So the first company that I worked for, those uh, you know, Twilight Soul Suckers, they were uh, called, they called themselves BlackRock Asset Management. And they actually specialized in uh, asset, uh, blah, 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 mortgage back securities. You guys remember those? How old do they turn out, huh? All right, but these guys actually measured their risk really well. They made this thing called the green package and all it did was measure the risk of the market. So what they did that was really smart was they were like, well, the market's gonna die soon. So we're gonna bet against the market that we specialize in. And they did that for a really long time until the market sank and they were like, ha ha, suck us. And they went around and bought up pieces of everybody else. So they jumped from the fourth largest asset, largest asset manager in the world from when I worked for them to now number one because they just bought up pieces of everyone else who failed because they understood the risk, right? And that's what you gotta do. If everything else is going to shit, you gotta make sure you've covered your own ass so you don't fail and here's how you do it. All right, so first of all, you have to understand what's at stake when you invest in something. For example, when you invest in a supercomputer, um, it's gonna cost you money. Everything costs you money. Shocking. I know. So if you invest in the first PlayStation and you do nothing with it, it becomes a sunk cost. Yeah, you can play some cool games on it, but that's about all you're gonna do for a while. All right, um, each additional investment, every time you buy a new unit, it's going to just add to the sunk cost and it's going to add to storage space. Um, and storage space, if you don't realize it already, costs lots and lots of money. You know with your storage locker. Oh yeah, okay. So you definitely want to keep in mind how much time and how much space you're putting in every time you invest in a piece. So a little bit of financing 101. Economics is the study of scarcity. What that means is whenever you purchase something, you give up your ability to purchase something else, right? So you have to pick what you want to buy. So if you really want to buy a supercomputer, then by all means, you can go and buy yourself a nice supercomputer. But you have to understand that every time you don't put money into that, it's money that could be going to all sorts of other cool stuff that you could be doing, right? Think about what, it's, what benefits it's going to provide to the community that you're trying to serve. So uh, ask around. Maybe your members really all want a supercomputer in their space to be the first space to have something like that. Or maybe they want to buy other things or find new projects. All right, so what's at, space when you, what's at stake when you invest in a space? First of all, money. Um, there are overhead costs like 
friends from storage and all that jazz. And also overhead for heat, water, electricity, internet. That's the first thing that you want to make sure you have covered. So go around, ask for money, make sure you have enough cash to support that first month of operation, um, including the deposit. It's a lot of quick spaces. If you want to rent out, you have to rent Okay. And if you invest in the first month and you do nothing else, it's just like that first guest one. It's just on cost. It's fun. Okay? Um, so you got to remember to finish what you start. Eat all your vegetables, kids. You hear that, baby? Eat your vegetables. Okay. <laughs> so it's pretty easy to get excited to start. You run some PR. Hey, everybody, I'm starting this cool new thing. You fundraise. You get a lot of money. You run some really nice events, fancy, fancy boathouse parties. Um, but it's really hard to keep that commitment. Um, so to keep from going crazy trying to reach your goal, um, if you think about if you've done half the work, then you're halfway there. If you've done a quarter of the work, then you just have to multiply by two twice. Aha. Okay. All right. <laughs> a nice little basic chart to remember. Once you get money, that money pools into funds, and you can use those funds to pay for overhead and fund awesome events. Those events bring in the attention of members, and the more members you get, that gives you more money. And the more money you get goes into funds, and funds bring in overhead, and more cool events that bring in more money, and more members which bring in more money. Okay, which brings up a little bit about membership pricing. How do you want to price your membership? Um, it's not some arbitrary number that you pick out of your hat, like, I'm going to charge you 150, and then the next person that walks in going like, I'm going to charge you 25 bucks because I'm in a good mood today. No, well, um, it has to cover at least rent and overhead. Um, so any additional funds from donations and fundraising, the ticket sales, they should go into future events and your savings, your supercomputer. So you have to make sure that your membership pricing, at the very least, has to cover your overhead. Um, basic but important formula to remember, the price of membership per month times the number of members you have in each month equals your monthly revenue. Okay. So um, if, for whatever reason, uh, you want to keep your membership low, then your members have to be under the agreement that they're going to be paying a lot more finance. If you want uh, to have everybody join, then you have to make sure that you're pricing your uh, membership fees low, and then everyone's going to come in, but you got to make sure that you have the space to do it. That's another um, more members does give you more money, but also remember the more members you have, the less space you have. Um, so in certain places like New York, where I'm from, uh, space is really, really expensive, and you just can't afford to have that many members at a low cost because then you won't be able to find a space. Shock New York. All right. Also consider how much money are your members making. Um, so the initial group that you draw in and the kind of people that you want to draw in eventually, if you are working with a group of students, they're not going to be able to pay that much to be in a space. But people who have high-paying tech jobs, they're going to be able naturally to give more money to the space. So what your membership fee is saying to them is um, that the space means something to you, that you're putting something that means something to you to get something out of the space, to be a part of something really special, right? Um, but then again, it also shouldn't hurt. Like, that's the idea of the impoverished student, okay? Say you have a really cool guy who's, or a really cool gal who is currently unable to pay the dues for whatever reason. Try and come up with some kind of staggered pay scale. So, like, you call it a starving hacker rate or a student hacker rate or something like that where they have to prove that they're a student and they're currently unemployed um, in order to get a reduced rate with reduced uh, membership privileges so that they can still be a part of the space and contribute and bring something up. Okay. Also, um, let's start watching what you sign. Um, definitely read through all the terms of your lease. Make sure um, everything's insured, everything's okie dokie. Um, you don't want to walk into a space that isn't, doesn't have the right permit uh, for you to work out of. Um, you can't work in a residential space. Um, and make sure that you have all of your insurance covered in case this happens. 
I mean, it's a hacker space, it might, right? You're working with fire, fire, fire. All right. Okay, so what if some guy wants to come in, cut his arm off with a power tool? Okay, so first, <laughs> you want to draft a good waiver with the rules of using the space and respecting the space and respecting the other people in it so that this guy won't do something like that. All right. Aww. All right. Um, but you also have to keep in mind that if someone actually comes in and saws his arm off and then sues you, you are in a lot of shit anyway. Waivers are only good on some sort of psychological level. Like you signed this piece of paper here. You read this. You know these were our rules. Why did you go and stick your arm in the chain, like in the saw? I mean, really, what were you thinking? You know, oh, I wanted to try and see if it actually sawed my arm off. Okay, now you know. But um, if this guy decides to sue you because you weren't protecting him in your space, um, then the waiver doesn't really hold that much ground in that court of law, unfortunately. So you really just have to be uh, very, very careful. Um, training on all power tools uh, before you allow someone to go and use it. Um, just make sure to cover as much of um, your own behind. Okay. Um, how do one be free? Um, I'm bringing this up just as sort of a side topic. Um, filing for 501c3 status allows your space to, a, a, uh, to accept donations that are non-taxable. So if I want to donate $1,000 to your space, then I can get the 35% um, of that back in taxes. Um, similarly, donations from, organ uh, from other organizations and corporations seem a lot more friendly if they can get a nice uh, tax um, it is a bit of paperwork to file, which is why you should talk to people and ask for their advice. Uh, like, um, Rogue has a really nice step on talk about it. You should check it out, but don't hound her for it, because she might hurt you. All right. Also, <laughs> I heart you. All right. Fiscal sponsorship. Okay, so another way, because it costs, uh, I think, like, a thousand bucks or so to file for 501c3, and it's a lot of paperwork, you can also go the route of fiscal sponsorship. You can fall under the umbrella of another organization. They take a small percentage of the donations that you receive from any other organization, and in return, you can use their name to also get tax-deductible donations. All right, um, so if you're not sure about 501c3, sponsor that has a similar mission to your organization. Um, this is important just because you want to you want to be under an organization that shares your same goal. Otherwise, it's almost like, well, what's the point? Um, they also are more eager to support you, and you can also have a better network. Like, for example, if you fall under the fiscal sponsor of another educational entity, and your hacker space does a lot of classes, open education classes for kids in the neighborhood, then you can use the, uh, the grant that they have written for certain organizations and use that for your organization to get more money that way. Uh, okay. Also remember, if you need help, just ask. This is a basic lesson that you learn in kindergarten. Don't forget it. Kindergarten was a very important year. Okay? Um, first, asking for money. Hey, you want to talk to people, and don't talk to them like, you know, give me your money, because that's not asking, that's called mugging, and you might get arrested. Um, instead, say, I want your help, I'm doing this really cool thing, please give me your help in any way you want. If you're really enthusiastic, that travels really well, and people really just want to help you out especially if you're really cute, and then you put up those like sad little doggy eyes, like, okay. Bring a baby, or a puppy, or a ball cat. All right. Um, these are places where you can ask for money. So one place is by holding events. If you hold any kind of auctions, or parties, raffles, sales, um, every space should be doing cool stuff like this anyway. So you may as well throw in some things that can make you money. Right? And another place is grant writing. This is back when I was talking about 501c3s and fiscal sponsors. 
If you can uh, write a good grant to an organization that shares your goals, to corporations, governments, foundations, funds, and trusts, these are all places where you can go to to say, hey, I'm running something really cool. I know you guys have a similar mission to ours. Please give us some money so we can do cool stuff together. Um, also, donations. Um, you can ask your members for personal donations. You can ask non-members who just believe in your cause for donations. Um, you can ask if people work for companies that have uh, matching gifts. Um, a lot of corporations will give the same amount of money up to a certain certain amount. Like, I don't know, let's throw out a number, like $5,000. If I give $5,000 to a space, my company will give another $5,000 to a space. Also, a lot of companies give gifts in time, which are just like, things that they don't need anymore that they're trying to get rid of, like t-shirts or filing cabinets or power wheels, I don't know, all sorts of things they want to give away. Okay, also remember to ask for help. Also puppy dog eyes help too. So before you make a move, ask someone who's done it before. So you want to check out the map on hackerspaces.org to see other existing organizations and see if you can learn anything from them. Um, and it's also nice because advice is a lot cheaper than asking for money, so people are a lot more willing to give it. So, yay. All right. Last step, being open to change. Um, another really great lesson from a really great kids thing. All right? The, the crazy hair goes start at the beginning, and when you come to the end, stop. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> always, always think, if something isn't working, what can I do to make it better? All right, publicity, publicity, publicity. It should be going on 24-7, all the time, all the time, time, time. Okay, um, you should have weekly events just to keep things rolling all the time. Um, any kind of ideas that you have um, that are really fun, ask around, ask the community, what is it that everybody in your space wants? What is it that people outside of your space want to have or see or do? Okay, and also plan some really nice monthly and annual events, like the fundraisers, like uh, parties and galas and games, yada, yada, yada. All right. Get involved with your community. Um, your community leaders give a lot of non-monetary support as well. For example, if you want to do some kind of community space to run some kind of cool event, um, if you know your community leaders, you can hook that up. Also, um, people in your community provide uh, donations, okay, when you do host these events. Money is the root of all evil. Yeah. But it's not! Okay. Um, if you want to make money as a means to an end, um, then go ahead and become an investment banker. Sucks for you. All right. Um, but if your end goal is some really awesome project, then you're going to need a, to figure out a way to reconcile this sort of hatred that we have with money. Money isn't an evil thing. It's a tool that we use to... Uh, it's a means to an end, you know? So the same way we use tools to build stuff, money is a tool we use to build projects, to build funds, um, to make things happen. Okay, so don't fear money, conquer it, all right? When money starts to come in, you want to set up some kind of fund for it. It shouldn't just go off to the side, throw it into a bank account, and you're just thinking, oh, yay, it's nice to have some money lying around. Part of that fund to go into a fund for what happens if everybody in my space contracts some like weird STD that only affects hackers in your community and they all die. <laughs> I don't know, right? And then you're sitting there going, oh no, how do I keep this going and get more people to join in? Huh? No, I said what if? What if? some weird disease. Bobic's the antidote. Bobic's my anti-drug. All right. So, <laughs> so if you have something that for some bizarre reason everyone in your space dies, there's no way to cover your costs for three months, there's still something sitting in the bank that will keep your rent going until you're able to rebuild. So part of that fund, that should be the first fund you set up. Your next fund can be your supercomputer fund, or your cool project fund, or your 3D uh, printer fund, whatever that might be, all right? Um, vote on what your space needs. Maybe they don't want a supercomputer, maybe it's just you, all right? And um, then reinvest the money into new projects, and those projects 
find out some way to be creative to fund new projects. Um, for example, uh, NYC Resistor, if you guys check out, um, they actually have a wiki for um, when they bought their first laser cutter. Um, they did something really interesting. They actually didn't raise funds for the laser cutter. They just sort of went around and was like, all right, we want to buy this $20,000 laser cutter. Um, can everyone sort of pool in their money? We're going to buy this, and then we're going to figure out some way to pay everybody back. And it worked out really well. So they put this all online, and every single piece of the cost um, is completely open, which I love. Um, that every single member and every single even non-member can go in, check out how they did it, exactly what things cost, and it's really transparent. Um, and after they put down the $20,000 for it, they started uh, having classes, $75 a class for anyone who wants to learn how to use a laser cutter, and that was really popular. They charged for per usage fees for people who weren't members to use it. And then eventually they started pulling up a fund that was just to pay back for the laser cutter. And eventually, when that gets paid back, they're going to have to, they're going to start accumulating funds on top of that so that they can build cooler projects and buy more awesome tools that will again be used to create funds for more awesome projects and bigger tools. So you see, this is all cyclical. Uh, all right. Um, I just like this picture because it just reminds me of a hacker space. It's like, you know, a bunch of people sort of like walking all over the place and something that doesn't really make mathematical or logical sense, but it sort of like all fits together, you know? Um, yeah, Thing, what, what goes up must come down. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, so where are we headed? Um, so uh, this is what I see hackerspaces becoming in the future and why I got really interested in it. Um, first of all, just the community aspect of it, hackerspaces bring people together. Um, they bring all sorts of really awesome people together, um, sort of like Nauticon and they talk about all the cool interests that they have and they build new stuff together. Um, education, where it's totally not like a school, and I say this coming from the perspective of a teacher where I sit down with um, all of my kids and they just go, man, school sucks. We don't learn anything useful at all, right? But then I'm like, hey, you wanna pick into someone's locker? They're like, yeah, and they think that's really cool. And I'm like the coolest math teacher because I can break into their locker with a beer can. Um, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> it's really nice that we can show people that there are other forms of education. We make shit, we break shit, we make new stuff happen. Um, it's all new kinds of education. I hope to eventually bring it into a school atmosphere because why shouldn't school be fun? And also, just innovation. Um, all sorts of inventions happen in hacker spaces, and I want to make sure we can keep this going. So, rock on, everybody. Okay. Okay, so I have time for questions and answers. Sweet. Questions and answers? Aren't, uh, oh, thank you. Did they get start over? Okay. Uh, this isn't so much a question as a comment. And coming from my background in physics and astronomy, supercomputers aren't so much as like you know, yay, cool, shiny thing to have. As this is a tool to use. Yeah. And if you're thinking about getting into supercomputing, the first thing that we do is look at what we want to do with it and how, many re how much resources that takes. And in fact, there was a paper, I don't remember the authors unfortunately, published back in 2000 about the benefits of slacking, meaning since Moore's Law doubles your computational, compo computational power every 18 months for a given cost, if you have a certain level of computational power you need, it might be advantageous financially to wait 18 months so that that's now at half price. Uh, and that was just the, the one comment I wanted to make, like if any hacker spaces were thinking about, you know, building their own supercomputer and things like that. Yeah. Actually, I don't think any hacker space really has the size and, like, the necessity right now for having a supercomputer. Um, I just wanted to use it as sort of, like, an analogy for a hacker space. But, yeah, eventually I hope we get there.
So, hi, I'm Chris. I'm with Hive13 in Cincinnati. We're the Cincinnati hackerspace. And uh, when we opened up, everybody cleaned out their closets and brought in all of their junk computers and uh, CRTs. A uh, good first rule when you open a hackerspace, uh, no CRT rule right at the beginning. <laughs> We're drowning in them shits. We got uh, like CRTs just stacked up to a wall. It's going to fall over and kill someone. Um, but anyway, we have a uh, just, it's a, we call it the stupid grid. It's a, it's a stack of old crap PCs that we uh, link together. Well, not we, some, one of our guys linked together. And it's this like low end uh, distributed, uh, you know, Beowulf cluster. And uh, I have no freaking idea what they do with it, but you know, it's there. It makes the room hot. So. <laughs> Uh, well, the hope is, uh, I, m me personally, I'm a like, super competitive boink guy, mm -hmm. so I'm hoping that I can just appropriate it to boost my score on boink, but, um, <laughs> All right. but that, that's it. You can make anything out of, uh, you know, with this Moore's Law thing where, uh, you know, everything doubles, uh, people throw away steadily nicer and nicer shit. Yeah. So, uh, so keep Which that in mind. You could probably use a nicer fit to replace your less nice. Right, and like, for example, uh, uh, eight months ago, the price on flat screen LCDs plummeted for some reason, and so like we got this, uh, we have an embarrassment of uh, rear projection large screen TVs, we have like four of them in the space, um, and it has something to do with the capacitor plague, uh, so like people's rear projection screens break, and they're like, you know, forget it, I'll just, I'll just get a, you know, sexy flat, flat screen like Dr. Dre. And uh, like at trash heaps, there's these giant TVs. And so like I just walked into the hacker space after being out for a week, and it looks like uh, Circuit City from 1985. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, I'm just going to interject here uh, because I'm a. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to shamelessly plug myself. Uh, Cleveland does have a hacker space. It's called the Makers Alliance. I'm the president. So Woo! hi everybody. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, if you would like to learn more about it, um, after 8 o'clock, I'll be up in the hackerspace room. Otherwise, just go ahead and visit. There's all sorts of stuff up there. It's a great time. So, thanks. Sweet. Um, there's a question about um, places that have supercomputers. Um, there's a place I volunteer at sometimes called Perry, the Pisgah Astronomical Research Institute. It's, in, it's near Asheville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. It used to be a, a government facility that listen to other country satellites and things like that. So um, they left 300 with 300 trailer loads of equipment, but they left behind two 26 meter radio telescopes. And so uh, what happens is volunteers show up. And so it's, it's kind of like a con a little bit. Um, so it's a temporary, sp it's the volunteers show up and they work on things to try to uh, bring the facility back to life, but they've got probably more computer power than most other institutions in, in uh, the western part of North Carolina. Was there a question aspect to that or like just no another comment? Okay. Cool. How does your uh, hack space uh, dispose of like the CRTs? Agreed. I was talking more along the lines of like uh, ecological. 
actually uh, disposing of tech. Especially with the, with the the upcycling, people are throwing out nicer and nicer crap. You want to replace the crap that you do have. Again, motherboards, things like that. Just pay for it. Just pay to get it dumped. Um, and then and and then it's free. But, uh, well, another place to look, uh, an, another place to look, uh, especially with the community outreach, is um, there are organizations in cities that are looking to give work to uh, people who are coming out of the prison system, and they have grant money to pay people to do stuff. So if you have crap that, you know, I mean, we're all engineers and, you know, yeah, I know how to desolder all the caps out of a motherboard, but I'm not going to do that for 40 hours a week. You know, I'll, you know, do something else. So, but though there are people who need to learn, you know, they need a job, and uh, then and somebody else already has the money to pay people to do that stuff. And so sometimes you can get people in to do the, so just because, you know, there's some giant thing that, you know, oh, we need the stepper motors out of those scanners, but who's going to who's going to spend a whole weekend, you know, taking the stepper motors out of uh, a pallet of scanners. There might be people that you can get to do that stuff for you and you're helping the community and they're helping you. That's a really nice point. And also like um, to sort of jump on that. If you considered a, have you considered like an artistic aspect to it? Like cuz uh, there are a lot of really cool art projects that are being done just by breaking up old antiquated software and building uh, sculptures out of it. There was one guy, I think he was featured in the New York Times the one that he took apart all these like really, really old uh, typewriters. And using only old typewriter pieces, constructed like sexy robot models. Um, and that was really cool. And he was like, oh man, these are the hottest things ever because he was a real geek. But um, anyways, <laughs> yeah, like you could make a cool art project out of it instead of having to pay someone to get rid of it. Um, if no one's really going to be using the parts, and they're just like busting it open, taking the parts, and piecing them back together in some kind of cool like art that's, you know, sellable. Maybe you could raffle it off at your next super hacker event or something. Our our wall is held up by hard drive magnets in our space. Yes. <laughs> um, I, t t two quick comments. Uh, I'm Bob, and this is Nathan. We're from Arch Reactor in St. Louis. Um, one, when you're looking for a space and you see those per square foot numbers, that's per year usually. That really confused me when we were looking for a space. When you see like 550 a square foot for a commercial space, that's per year. Because you'll look at a number and it'll be like, oh, that space would be $40,000 a month. No, nah, you know, divide it by 12. Uh, the other comment is, um, like for us, I, I don't know how it is for other places, but the partnerships with like local organizations have been the biggest source of memberships for us. Um, just in terms of, of, of partnerships. Um, right now, we're, we're in the process of moving into a new space, and we have a really, hopefully, it will be fruitful partnership with a, with a local art bike group that's in return for our expertise and, uh, and help with electronics. Uh, they're going to give their expertise and help with their uh, metal shop. Um, so, you know, just for a trade, we get access to a complete uh, metalworking shop. Hello. Um, I remember when you were talking to me about membership fees and your feelings on where they should be and how it drives the membership. And when I first heard the numbers you were spouting, my head was like, boop. But I sort of saw your logic to it. But would you go through a little bit of that again, where the range is really, because I don't think a lot of people understand where membership fees, in your opinion, should ideally be. A lot of hacker spaces go between the $75 to $100 range per month. 
for uh, for a fee for hacker spaces, and I think that's enough of a like a light pain point, you know, um, because that's like a hundred dollars a month is like a small amount of cash. You're saying, um, you know, this is valuable enough of uh, an investment to me that I'm willing to put this out. And a lot of I've heard a lot of arguments like, you know, we want to price our uh, membership a lot lower. Like, let's say that we do, you know, like thirty dollars a month. Dollars a month, and we can bring in more people that way. And that's, um, I mean, the thing with that is, like, yes, we get people who wouldn't have been able to finance it otherwise. What that also hurts is people who are able to pay are paying less than um, less than what's saying, like, this is really valuable. Because, I mean, fifty dollars is just half of the pain of like hundred dollars a month, literally. Um, so you're you're, what you're risking is getting people who are just sort of interested, but might not be as dedicated. This is like this is just my personal opinion on it. Um, but uh, there are certain people who really just can't make that cut. And for those people, you can specify, you know, if you are unemployed for X amount of time, if you are currently a student, then there is uh, a fee waiver up to a certain point. So maybe for those people, you can have like a thirty dollars fee they come into the space. Um, but otherwise, they're just like, I feel like $70 to $100 is a really like nice little boundary as far as membership prices. You know, like this is really, really worth something to me, but not pushing people over the edge because they're not willing to pay. By the way, people from Packer Spaces, can you just like, can, can I just come up and like talk to you? Because I always want to go to New York. Like, it'll give me an excuse to travel. Uh, one, the only other thing I wanted to say was, uh, like, put the walls up as quick as you can. Um, like, we had, like, when Hive 1.3 was trying to bootstrap, we met at, like, coffee shops and stuff. And the group that we got together in the coffee shop, the, we had folks made it to the board. You know, we got people to be on the, on the board of directors. They're still there. But we lost almost all of our, our original bootstrap crew. And the walls brought in our real, uh, like like our our really great members. We've gotten we've picked up some you know like mechanical engineers and electrical guys, you know dudes that are coming in and designing circuit boards for us, uh, uh, replacement boards for uh, uh, MakerBot Electronics. If anybody's interested in that, because um, uh, you can't because you can't get Mendel Electronics online, um, uh, and we didn't get them until we had the walls. So, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, and everybody, our, our original uh, coffee shop group, you know, they were like, oh, I'd like to have a, you know, lead sink, and I'd like to have all this other stuff. And those people are all gone. And, you know, like, so the people who voted on the name, gone. People who decided on, on the space that we were going to go with, most of them are gone. You know, and now it's, it's, it's an institution, and the new blood that came in is, is better than the old blood. So uh, get in, you know, Get, get walls up fast, and that's where the real magic happens. Thanks. I'm Joe from the uh, Cleveland Makers Alliance. <clears throat> My blog is instantcallout.com. I'm an EC2 programmer. I got here a little late. I don't know if you discussed that. It's an Amazon virtual computer uh, at will system. You can set up a, a supercomputer on it. And I, I just think wanted I've to. Heard of that. Yeah, but I didn't mention my talk. Yeah, you can you can do all kinds of things with it. Clusters of hundreds of computers, and uh, there's some interesting work being done on. Uh, searching through genes. There was some recent news on singularityhub.com on that. And uh, if anyone wants to try that out and try their hand on EC2, just uh, drop me a message. Thanks. Thanks, Fabulous. OK. Um, if anyone wants to find me, you can just tweet me, Christina underscore pay. All right? It was nice uh, having you guys. Thank you.